Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of the 2015 DLF eResearch Network. Today's topic is Research Data Management Services at your institution. My name is Rita Van Dynan, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Before we get started, there's just a few logistical items I need to mention. Um, for those of you presenting today, as you already know, audio is accessible either through conference call line or voice over IP. Uh, the chat window on the left can also be used for any comments or questions throughout today's session. If at any time during the webinar you experience any technical difficulties, just send me a private chat so that I can troubleshoot with you. And to do that, just mouse over my name and click on the private chat option. You can also send me an email, and I'll post my email address in the chat window. And also note, you can exit and re-enter the webinar at any time. So during, joining us today are our e-research e network faculty and clear postdoctoral fellows. We have Jason Clark from Montana State University, Kendall Rourke from the University of Alberta, Margarita Corral from Brandeis University, and Plato Smith from the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. Also in the audience today is our new director for the Digital Library Federation, Bethany Novisky, and I'm sorry if I slaughtered your name, Bethany. Um, so welcome, Bethany, and uh, we're so glad that you could join us today. So today's webinar uh, will cover the following. We'll first hear from our guest speaker, Scott Brandt from Purdue, and then we'll have some time for Q&A with him. Uh, then we will um, review the slides that each institution sent in for the group activity. And we'll have some time for discussion about those. And then I have just a couple of housekeeping things at the end of today's webinar uh, just to mention. And then, of course, tweet about it. And there's our hashtag and the clear DLF mention. And also, if Richmond is in the audience, uh, welcome to our newest members. The University of Richmond um, has just recently joined the network, which is great news. They weren't able to um, prepare the slides in time for today's session, but I do have a placeholder for them in the event they want to chime in. So with that, um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Plato Smith, who's going to introduce our guest speaker. Plato, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Rita. Scott Brandt is a professor of library science and former associate dean for research in the Purdue University Libraries. He leads the library's research data group, and his research investigates issues in research data management and curation. He's interested in how library science can be applied to problems in other disciplines, and he has been on many interdisciplinary collaboration and grants. He helped found the Distributed Data Curation Center in 2006. He led the research that resulted in the Data Curation Profiles Toolkit in 2009 and the subsequent Data Curation Profiles Directory. He received his BA degree in English Literature and his MLIS from Indiana University. He worked previously as associate head in the MIT libraries and is author of two books, Teaching Technology and Unix in Libraries. And now the floor is yours, Scott. Thank you very much, Plato. I want to thank you and the other uh, faculty and fellows for this opportunity to share about our program. And also, thank you, Rita. It's always a pleasure working with um, CLEAR and DLF. Um, and I think you guys are doing a great job, especially with the fellows program. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to talk about uh, research data and consultation and collaboration at the Purdue Libraries. So I'll try to um, focus on uh, some particulars, but also some generalities in terms of um, how I see what we do fits with you know what others do or, or sort of trends going on. Um, I think it's sort of fitting to start off with a definition. Um, and I like this one for the reasons that are shown here that uh, the work that we do is meant to be active as opposed to passive. I think we're sort of past the idea of waiting for people to come to us in libraries. 
um, and uh, enhancement in digital curation, data management, um, does mean that there are these other things that need to um, be included. And I think um, librarians are, are very good at looking at the sort of details and reminding uh, folks about that and helping with that. And then that uh, the goal is that um, data will be discoverable you know, over um, long periods of time by um, uh, wide groups of people. And this just makes sense to me because this is what libraries do. So at Purdue we tend to focus on sort of um, smaller science researchers and I just wanted to remark on this as some context. Our focus has kind of been around groups that are less com connected communities. And I think that um, there are, um, you know, someone said something to the effect that, you know, 80% of all data is created by 20% of the people or something like that in research. And to me, my mind immediately goes to, what about those other 80% of the people, you know? It's not that their data is less important or whatever, it's just that there are a lot of other people who don't necessarily have large groups that are, you know, sort of dictating uh, what metadata to use, what formats to use, etc. And so, again, plenty of room for us as um, libraries to be involved. If we had a guiding principle, I, I think for us at Purdue, it, it would be that multiple approaches are needed. I'm going to talk uh, primarily about um, the data services group, but data services really is just an integral part of all the things that we do in the libraries, and we do a lot of other things in the libraries. But we sort of work from this philosophy that we need a two-pronged approach for research data services. Um, our institutional data repository, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and then the consulting and collaboration. Um, and then there are a wide variety of other things that we do as well, but I kind of want to focus on those, um, those things in particular. So the data creation profiles work for us was sort of really this entry into learning about what researchers do and what it would take to um, share data. And uh, in fact, the sort of um, uh, subtitle was um, who's willing to share what with whom and when. And um, for us, it was that the profiles helped us figure out what it would take to sort of develop requirements or meet the needs of the researcher in order to share the data. And that uh, throughout the profile, basically what we learned were the kinds of questions to ask people and then try to come up with help or solutions for them to be able to deposit their data and work through these issues. So um, for us, it's kind of this overall organizational approach. Again, this is like, so if Dean were to talk about the services of the libraries, that we have sort of, we are a decentralized library system. So we have liaisons that are distributed out in um, various divisions. They uh, work with uh, various groups of faculty. And then we have what we call the sort of centralized library services. And the, again, there's not just the research data management and the PER, but there are, we have digitization center, uh, archives and collections. In publishing, we also have um, the document repository. We have our rights management. The university copyright office is in the libraries. And that together, we're sort of a network team uh, bouncing back and forth, asking, you know, could you help me with this question? Here's a person who thinks they have a copyright issue. Could you help with this problem? This person has documents in addition to their data. Could we talk with them about if they could put it into the EPUBs? So we try to make sure that we have these connections. And then that extends out to the campus as well, that um, we work closely with our um, the VPR in particular and um, our IT groups on campus. And these relationships have been built up over time. I think that if there was you know, a sub theme to this kind of a talk, it's that some things seem to take an unusually long time. And um, I had the pleasure in 2009 to actually work in the VPR's office. Um, we've had people who work uh, on research projects with Hub Zero and the Rosen Center. And so really working at building those relationships is sort of really core to being able to do these things. And then who we do it for is, um, I refer to it as support across the research life cycle. It's really all about scholarly communication, research, and teaching. Um, but then the faculty, the graduate students, and the undergraduate students. 
then my sort of view of this would be the sort of boots on the ground view. Um, and I'll start with um, sort of this is my representation that research data is, you know, sort of the cornerstone, insert smiley face, um, and that we uh, sort of work outwardly. There are a group of additional specialists in the libraries. Um, some of them are um, sort of independent, like our GIS person, or we have user interface. Uh, user experience person, information literacy, and then we have um, liaisons that are um, recent um, hires who are uh, like a bioinformaticianist. Bioinformat we have um, a plant sciences expert we're going out to recruit, um, and um, the lay the we work closely with the specialists, but then we also work with the liaisons to support them in working with the faculty and students and staff. And uh, oftentimes we're partners with the liaisons, but then sometimes we are also proxies for the liaisons that um, if they can't go out and meet with the um, faculty for whatever reason, um, then we'll go out and meet with them. If they can't um, you know, be on a grant for whatever reason in terms of commitment, then, then uh, we'll decide whether or not we can do that within the research data group. Um, so that there is this sort of, uh, as I say, working outwardly from uh, the research data um, team to work with then all of the sort of people we see as constituents. So um, I'd like to start with PER because PER really is a well-heeled um, uh, mature service that we're developing. I mean, it's not as mature as it could be, but uh, in terms of providing a um, stable service. Um, we looked at sort of the uh, OAIS model when we um, started PER, but we also realized that to be a service, we would really need to sort of work along a life cycle. So um, we think it, of it in terms of planning, collaborating, sharing. Um, publishing is a primary um, uh, service in PER, and then being able to preserve data. And we work on uh, sort of policies and then um, the approaches for working with um, the users in using PER. And again, this is uh, PER has a repository position, a, a repository specialist position. Um, the data services uh, group as a whole works with uh, researchers in PER, but the liaisons also may very well be the partner who works with um, the research or um, students on um, creating a PER project and uh, uploading data. But we do this as um, uh, people can come to PER for sort of the full service of uh, find resources for data management planning or uh, contact somebody for assistance. Um, we can collaborate with them on projects. Uh, so for instance, um, we can join as a project member and be involved in a project, or we can help them setting up their projects and then uh, uploading data so that they can share it within their community. They can invite people to collaborate on the project from outside of PER, uh, outside of Purdue. Um, and then um, they can publish. Uh, they can publish in uh, multiple ways. And then uh, we are developing this preservation uh, um, environment underneath of it. Um, and then we'll um, be able to provide long-term preservation, but integrate that into the other work that we do as um, libraries so that the um, preservation becomes a collection management decision that involves the librarians, the layers on. So just as a further example of how we sort of integrate across the campus to collaborate, um, this is from the Office of the Sponsored Program Services. Anyone who goes after, um, uh, wants to um, go after a grant has to fill out a pre-proposal so that it can set into motion all the accounting that goes behind that. And one of the questions on that form is, does your funder require a data management plan and are you um, planning to use PER? And then we can get notification when people um, initially submit this. And then if their grant is awarded, we can get um, uh, notification that they have been um, awarded uh, the, their grant uh, so that it gives us another opportunity to talk to them. At the same time, we then get the information that we can sort of map when they're getting closer to the end of a, a grant uh, and talk to them, remind them this is you know what we said we are going to do with PER and uh, work with them at that point as well. Um, 
the um, just a, as another sort of example of the coordination that we do across the campus, when we first started out, there was a question of, you know, well, are you going to put up information that shouldn't be put up there? And so we worked to find the uh, people who were the experts across campus to deal with um, FERPA, um, HIPAA, IRB, uh, export control, um, to ensure that um, we know uh, that they know what this service is doing and that anybody who goes to put up um, uh, data also knows that if it meets certain, it does not meet certain requirements, they will have to contact the um, appropriate person to talk with them about what they should or shouldn't be doing uh, regarding um, these requirements. The um, data publication uh, process, we were, um, I think, one of the first two uh, repositories in the U.S. offering data DOIs to create data publications. Um, you can uh, go to PER and look at a couple of videos. If you um, do, I recommend using the URL purr.purdue.edu, not um, Googling um, PER videos, insert smiley face. It's really weird to do this kind of webinar where I'm not getting any feedback, but um, onwards. Um, so this was yesterday's snapshot of where we are with PER. Um, as I say, this is updated on our web page, per.purdue.edu. Um, the um, uh, um, projects uh, represent uh, the um, the data management plan represents how many people that um, have said they are using uh, Purdue, and then there are a percentage of those that either are awarded or uh, that we're working with um, to uh, help with data management planning. Um, the number of registered researchers or how many projects or um, people are joining projects, and then the number of research projects. The total citations are for the uh, published data sets. And you can see the number of total published data sets is 225, which some people think is a lot, some people think isn't very much. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, in 2009, I think Nature was a little ahead of the curve in talking about where we are in data sharing. I mean, come on, the NSF hadn't even announced their you know, major mandate yet. Um, but I think we're starting to make a dent. So there we are, institutional repositories. Um, but I, I sort of have some speculation that I want to um, uh, sort of lay out there. Um, for you about, you know, why is it that it seems to be taking such a long time. Some people are fine with that and others, you know, kind of get paranoid about should we be doing more, should we be doing um, things faster. So um, let me talk a little bit about the other half of this group, which is the data specialists. Um, this, um, uh, I said they provide, we provide consultation and collaboration, uh, both with our liaisons and our researchers. Um, we have several uh, liaisons who are going great guns and have research collaborations and teaching going on. So it's not just this unit, but sort of we provide um, the, um, we're, we're charged with um, making sure that we provide uh, the knowledge and skills for people to ensure that we can meet these um, services. And so this is um, a list of the, um, what the unit does. We develop unit uh, goals each year, and then we have individual goals to guide our activities, and um, that those are then to make headway in these areas. So data management um, planning, and that could be uh, in terms of actually working with um, uh, people on data management plans or in doing data management um, uh, plan workshops, um, working closely with the liaisons. Um, uh, so. We um, have had several people who use the data curation profiles to assess data, um, uh, data management or data workflow, um, and then helping to coordinate um, using PER for data publishing. Often, uh, as I said, one of us or one of the subject liaisons will join the team and uh, work with um, the uh, researchers in their projects, and then uh, more and more to um, uh, integrate into courses and instruction. Uh, with data management skills or data information literacy. So here is, I wanted to give you an example of a couple of um, uh, things that we're doing, concrete examples. 
Um, so from one of those DMP workshops, uh, we got a request from someone who said, uh, we just got this uh, grant, and it's the USAID is, is saying that we have to donate a lot of um, uh, the um, uh, data. Uh, we have to deposit it in, but it, it's in a couple of different places. We're confused exactly how to do that. Can the libraries help us do that? Um, so the, the group is looking at um, data collected by um, uh, multiple African countries uh, from multiple uh, PIs. And so we proposed a workflow and a data management plan. And um, basically, we're trying to put the legs under uh, this data management plan to give it some uh, teeth um, and document what data and metadata is collected, who does it, when, and how. And we started off doing um, a data creation profile with the main PI, which is kind of interesting because the profiles are um, were designed initially to um, talk about what data do you have, what are you doing with it, and what would you like to do with it. And in this case, the person didn't have any data as of yet, but they wanted to sort of work through what might be uh, options that they should look at. So we, we don't necessarily recommend self-completion of data creation profiles by researchers, because there are a lot of sort of questions, and maybe it's the terminology that we use, um, and that it really allows for great um, interaction uh, with the researchers and insight into what they're doing. Um, uh, I am working with Jay Carlson on um, what we're calling the DCP 2.0, which will be an, the next, a roadmap for the next version of the data creation profiles. And we're taking into account a lot that we've learned over the past five years. Um, and maybe there will be a version that, um, that uh, would be uh, completed by a researcher. I talked to a colleague at Monash University in Australia, and they are um, doing something where a researcher fills out um, a couple of questions, and then they follow up with them with more questions. So here's um, another project. Um, one of our uh, ag folks introduced us to the International Plant Nutrition Institute. Um, and they dole out research funds to uh, uh, agronomists um, in the field. And they wanted to see a return on their investment in the data with the hope that it could be used by others. And so as part of a proposal, I drew up this graphic. And it kind of uh, represents how the requirements are all leaching away into the soil. Insert smiley face. And then we um, developed this pipeline to show the things that we felt needed to be addressed in um, a sort of a uh, data curation pipeline to ensure that there were practices, tools, and services that would um, ensure the use and reuse of data over time. So this project is currently under neg negotiation. A person, uh, a Purdue person, would need to be the PI in order to use PER. Uh, that's currently the way our policy is, because it's um, a project that is sponsored by the vice president for um, Purdue youth. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at having a mega project that would be a Purdue PI person who then the um, other projects, um, multiple projects, uh, would feed into um, her project. And in that way, we could have sort of a, a look at what all people are doing for their data and work with them on this project. And just as a, another example, the kind of things that we get um, asked to collaborate on, this um, sort of pipeline for a specific uh, project um, the, um, is also a USAID uh, grant. Uh, included um, data that was to be geocoded and so uh, and, and visualized, and so it involved working with uh, our GIS specialist. Uh, this proposal includes an initial framework for metadata, but then a feedback loop to work with the community to review and revise it. Um, you know, we wanted to build in uh, making sure that there was both community standardization but implementation of best practices. Um, and then, so depending on changes in the research scope or the conditions on the ground, we'd be able to make um, uh, changes, uh, not just have like this is one you know uh, uh, web form that you have to fill out, but we wanted to get make sure that we got input from people. And this kind of makes me think about um, in this we look at both the data producers upstream and the data consumers downstream, and sometimes for research data. People, it's, it's hard to sort of focus on both at the same time. It's like 
I have to focus on one end or the other. But I think it's important to remember that a data life cycle is likely to be input into another research life cycle. I think there are some disciplines that, that see this um, a lot easier than others, and that we're still at this point where people wonder, you know, why would anybody want to use my data? And um, the sort of question I put back to them is, if it were available, you know, who knows who would want to uh, see the data and see how it could be used. Uh, so anyways, the this sort of other end of the life cycle from uh, downstream is looking at data information literacy. And we were fortunate to have been the birthplace for the DIL project. Uh, I encourage anyone to visit this um, to see the latest things that there uh, are going on there. They now have a um, site for um, uh, collecting examples of how people are using data information literacy uh, competencies and uh, principles in developing um, courses, but also workshops and other instruction. So I mentioned earlier uh, this idea that things can take time. And um, I sort of want to point this out, that for us, we've gone through um, multiple uh, org charts to get to where we are now. Um, we sort of started off with something that was very streamlined back before we knew, you know, that uh, working interdisciplinarily with others and working especially with uh, in the research data area was a thing. And then we reorganized in 2006 and um, started a sort of small program. And at this point now we've um, grown our, we've reduced a little bit of the administrative uh, overhead, but we've uh, grown the program underneath of it so that there are um, four data specialist positions. Uh, there are four people working in PER. Um, and uh, then we work very closely with our library faculty, and that number is uh, continuing to grow. Um, I think it takes uh, not only time, it also takes opportunity. And we've been very lucky to have a dean that uh, goes after new positions whenever possible. When the university announces um, huge new additions, uh, initiatives, um, he's there with his hand out saying, well, in order to support this, we need more of our, uh, we need more libraries faculty. And because of the projects, like the ones I've shown you, we've been able to show them that it, it is a good investment for them. So, as I said, some things seem to take a really long time. And this is just something new that I've been thinking about, so bear with me. It, it really is speculation on my part. Um, so there is this adoption factor, right? And this is a graph that I took from Wikipedia that shows sort of that, what they call diffusion theory, right? So that there are the innovators and the early adopters, and then, and then they say there's the early majority, the late majority, the laggards. I don't like the word laggards, you know? I mean, there's often times reasons why people are not the ones who jump on the bandwagon right away. But, um, uh, the point is um, to realize that it, it, it does take time to get everybody engaged. Um, but I think, um, you know, maybe you guys actually have a better feel for this. I think that we're starting to get into that, like, early majority point where, you know, a large uh, percentage of, of libraries have, um, have a data person or look at data management planning or have a data, you know, website in order to support research data services. So I, I think we're starting to get going. In this particular graph, the gold line, uh, at least to me, represents that you know there are products and services that can be developed, but they really only come along when we you know sort of adopt the behaviors and skills and technologies, et cetera. And I, I, I think as a profession, I, I kind of see this as saying this is where where we are, you know, we're sort of in that early majority, we're sort of early times in terms of quote unquote market share. Um, but this is this is really the speculation part, is that I think this red line represents where sort of uh, researchers are in terms of being um, adopters of research data management in the way that we've been attracted to it. And um, uh, I, I just think that their curve is lagging behind our curve a little bit. And um, so I would, I would put them sort of here. And again, this is just speculation on my part. But um, I kind of feel like while we're stressed to get things going, 
that, you know, if you take this view, it also means we're kind of okay because we're ahead of the curve. I, that's, that's where I feel. We're ahead of the curve and that's okay. So in terms of some outcomes, um, I think the greatest ones are the partnerships and the relationships that we've built. Um, we, uh, we are and were and are continuing to uh, work with uh, Jeff up in the corner here. He was the um, first depositor in PER, but he's also the person behind the um, IPNI project that I mentioned. And then um, Sylvie was trusting enough to be filmed uh, being interviewed. Uh, and then she also allowed us to use um, her video in uh, the DCP workshops that we did um, a couple of years ago. And um, our work with uh, this example from the dance department brought a lot of people together and resulted in a first-of-a-kind um, archive collection for us. And so that was pretty special too. But it also started us really thinking about how do we have the three archives. We have um, e-archives. We have the institutional repository, uh, which is our document, and then we have the data repository. And um, we're looking at how to better integrate them, but not just sort of behind the scenes with you know technology, but also sort of what are the workflows so that when somebody has a question about data and we ask them about documents or you know they have a, it's a sort of an end of a um, career where they want to put up their data, are there other things that then might fit into the archive as well? So we want to sort of build on that and I think it's through these partnerships and relationships that is really um, the valuable outcome from a lot of this work. Um, I'm particularly proud of the outcomes from the Data Creation Profiles project. It's uh, been really interesting to see how dispersed the project has become. I'm constantly amazed reading articles or talking to people at conferences who said, well, we started with the profiles, but you know, then we, we, we modified it and we took some questions out and we put some questions in, and then we did this with it. You know, we, we made it into a survey or we made it into a couple of focus groups. And um, so uh, the data creation profiles were, were sort of behind the DIL project. Uh, Jake, who's up at Michigan right now, is using the data creation profiles uh, as a way to do a mass uh, serve, uh, sort of interviews uh, across the, his campus right now as they're building up their services. So uh, this is something that is sort of um, uh, I, I'm proud of, but I think it's it's something that a lot of people have been able to take and make their own as well. And then sort of, I guess this is really tooting my own horn a little, but I think it's great to be in a profession where um, you know things change and we can change with it. And that has certainly been uh, the case at Purdue. But I think you all are also doing great work and I'd love to hear from you. Einstein said that um, the difference between the person who knows the most and the person who knows the least is really insignificant um, compared to all there is to be known. And so with that, um, I'll leave it for you. OK, thank you, Scott. Uh, are there any questions? I see, I see one in the chat. <clears throat> Okay, it's on speaker, so. Hey, this is Gail at Caltech Hi, Gail. with Donna. Hi, Donna. Hi. Uh, we had a question for Scott um, with, the, um, with regards to an early statement and a wonderful presentation. Thank you for such a great presentation. But there was a premise that was put on the table um, kind of scooping the whole Purdue data initiative that the focus institutionally was on small science or um, not big science, where there's large scale data management infrastructures and data uh, centers or disciplinary repositories mm -hmm. in place. And, um, and the latter may be what we're finding at Caltech is more the case, is that we're more big science mm -hmm. oriented. But do you have any thoughts about if you had been big science oriented? Um, how things would have played out differently, what, you, what your findings would have been, what your response to those findings would have been, the whole shape of what Yeah, Donna, that's an interesting. Is colored by small science. And I'm just curious, if you rewound and started with the premise of big science, um, if things would have developed similarly yeah. or not. So um, 
Yeah, and our premise was that they've already got this taken care of, that, that it is by mandate or requirement. Um, you know, the, the, the subtitle of the project was who's willing to share what with whom and when. And um, just in a couple of interactions that we had uh, with a physicist and an astronomer, they said, well, that's sort of already taken care of. And, and we um, talked with uh, somebody at CERN and somebody at the Sloan Sky. And they said, oh, yeah, 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 we, we sort of have this in hand. But I think um, it's an interesting question because I was talking to a group of librarians at Notre Dame. And they had been pulled into a collaboration. And it happened to be at CERN, but it was that um, not so much the um, data itself, because you know the Large Hadron Collider, they, they put all that data in one place. It's, it's, it's all massaged, and then becomes a huge database that people can access. Um, what they found was that, for instance, the tools that people use in order to analyze their data. So they could say, here is the data that I got, and here's my analysis of that. But it was the tool that they used that maybe uh, research data management and curation practices could be applied to. So um, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to think you know, more about that question. But that's just sort of one of my reactions is that I wonder if we would have found that there were still other things that um, m maybe needed some attention or were still issues for people in those big areas as well. I'll, I'll bet you'll find out about those and let us know. I'm hoping. Hey, this is Sue. Um, kind of a follow-on to that um, is that I wonder if it would have met with some resistance because you would have been the, the group that began this would have been seen as potentially stepping on toes or applying additional mandates um, to well-established um, data processes. I think that's an interesting um, insight into how Purdue got started that I'm hoping we can apply at UNLV. Yeah. To, I, I will say for that the hanging fruits, the people who would welcome the assistance, I guess. Right. The, the people said, well, that's interesting. I mean, so initially it was we were told that we should expand by seeing if there were ways to collaborate interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary collaborations with people in research to expand our research agenda. And it just so happened that over and over again, it was people talking about, well, y you guys manage things. I'm having trouble managing my data. Or I, I don't know what to do about this. Is this something that you guys do? Um, but uh, in, in, I learned something uh, recently talking with uh, somebody. And there might be um, sort of an, an anthropology approach to um, going in and sort of just saying, I'm here just to learn. You know, and so to go in and learn, and then rather than come in and say, we, we want to find out what's going on, or we want to you know, solve problems, which we did not take that approach, by the way. We said, this is part of our research, and we're here to try and figure out, is this really a problem that we've heard elsewhere? And, but um, to be able to go in and just say, we, we really want to just learn from you. We did do, um, several years ago, we had um, in our humanities library a, a series where People, um, researchers came in to the libraries and talked about their research in the context of how they use the library for their research. And I think probably doing you know, programs like that could also be very interesting to say, you know, would you be willing to talk about your research? You know, um, um, if data comes up, you know, maybe talk a little bit about you know, your, how you address the mandates of uh, funders and that kind of thing. And just to be able to sort of get that, you know, um, exposure, a uh, person sitting on the outside looking in, and then sort of work your way in and ask questions and then go from there. So yeah, that's, that's a good point. I have one last question. Um, this is Sue again. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if anybody has successfully used the DCP as a, a worksheet for a think-pair-share exercise among workshop participants or students. I'm struggling to come up with some active learning techniques to, to get at data literacy with folks who already have a chunk of data in their mind. Um, 
hopefully somebody listening may be able to respond to this. I haven't I haven't heard of that particular thing. I have heard where people have taken um, data creation profiles uh, from the data creation profiles directory and sort of done sort of like reverse engineered and say so when you ask the question where do you think the question came from or you know uh, sort of to deconstruct the profiles um, and also we're we've been working with in particular um, several of the universities who um, have uh, used the data creation profiles as an exercise for students. I'm working with one res uh, LIS professor in particular who has really pushed her students to do to try and get to the point where they could publish their profiles and um, I'm supposed to talk with her later in the month to see sort of what they have been doing and sort of the students reactions to doing this which the the main reaction that I get that I hear from the students is that this really helped them see how to do this that you know talking in class there was sort of a theoretical approach but then it was really making them go talk to a researcher that made it real for them so that doesn't address what you said but maybe somebody else has uh, an answer as well and then I see Jason um, is asking about the hub zero project so for us hub zero uh, Purdue's the home of hub zero is an NSF project several years ago to develop a collaborative platform for um, nanoscience and it was to allow people to create tools that they could use in their web browser to analyze their data rather than have to pull down a tool install it and use it and then run it against their um, simulations or whatever um, and as part of that um, the uh, hub zero started um, a, a library of these tools and so when we got together in 2010, it was back in May when the NSF announcement came to, came out, the libraries asked to meet with the VPR and the CIO and a couple of other faculty. And they said, you know, could we, could we, um, you know, how would we uh, respond to this mandate? And the VPR said, well, there will be <laughs> two-page uh, DMPs with every uh, uh, grant that goes out. And they said, but is there anything else we could do? And that's when um, the people in uh, ITAP at Purdue said, um, well, is there any way we could use the Hub Zero as a platform for doing some of this? And so we started working with them and looking at you know, what would it need to do to, to be more of like a publishing platform um, because that would be useful for being able to mint DIO, DOIs and um, create citations for data. And so it's, it's a quick sort of uh, 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 how we started using Hub Zero. And Donna says that Tina gave a great poster at IDAP about lab group interviews and how to get um, data. So I didn't get the RDAP and we're supposed to have a debrief next week of all the people at Purdue that were RDAP so um, maybe I can look up Tina's poster um, working with a lab group is um, something that we have tried and others have tried and they um, uh, have found success in, in working with those groups uh, so Well, Scott, this is Rita um, chiming in. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the entire group for your wonderful presentation. And folks, you can keep typing questions to Scott uh, in the chat room and or, com and or comments, um, but we will uh, need to start moving forward with the rest of our presentation. And Scott, um, I'm happy that you'll stick around and, and hear what the rest of um, the group is doing in this area. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our friends at Caltech. So Donna and uh, Gail, you're able to advance those slides. Um, let me make sure you can do that. Um, let me make you pre uh, presenter, and then you should be able to advance your slide. OK, when you're ready, go ahead. There's the arrows in the bottom left-hand corner. Um. Okay, this is Donnie here. Gail, unfortunately, just had to step out. Um, so uh, we put together just a couple of slides on sort of where we are. I mean, we're really, um, I think like I mentioned last week, just kind of starting to survey the landscape and, and think about, um, you know, what's the situation here? What do we need to, you know, we really don't quite know what people are doing and or what help that they may need. Um, so, 
you know, like you can see that, you know, data management has a pretty low visibility um, footprint here. Um, and part of this was because back in 2010, um, you know, when, when the data management uh, requirements sort of first came online from NSF, uh, uh, the library's answer was to basically, you know, put together a two-page template um, that is on the library homepage right now. And for the most part, nobody's asked for anything else. And um, part of that, and, and I apologize if I may have told this story last week, um, you know, I, this was a question that I asked when I first came on board here in 2013. And um, the, essentially the, the story that I was told was there was a professor who um, submitted, I mean, multi-million dollar uh, NSF grant and um, didn't bother with a data management plan to submit, to submit that as part of the grant. And the NSF came back and said, um, well, where's your data management plan? And the researcher here basically said, well, you give me my money and I'll give you your data management plan. Needless to say, that went over like a ton of bricks. So uh, said researcher called uh, one of the librarians here and worked with them to get something and the grant eventually got funded. But so we're, we're you know, that, that's kind of, and as far as I can tell, that, that that's still probably a, a more prevalent than we'd like to admit attitude on this campus. So um, Caltech is very decentralized. Um, we do have um, a compliance office. I, oops, I apologize. Um, I apologize for the noise. Um, uh, what am I looking at here? OK, so we do have a office for research compliance. Um, but I think a lot of that is really not necessarily to impose things on Caltech, but to uh, meet, you know, basically just, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're in line with whatever federal and state regulations are being required. Um, we've heard drips and drabs from people about, you know, hey, I've got all this data, what should I do with it? Um, in terms of data, you know, I think the last bullet point here is, is pretty, is, is, might be the key because no one has faced compliance issues yet. So, you know, and a lot of these things have an teeth and, and from a related area um, in terms of, of, you know, things that are complying with federal mandates, and, you know, if any of you um, have any uh, responsibilities in the life sciences, you may also be dealing with this, uh, where NIH finally decided to put teeth into the, you need to have all your federally funded publications in, in PubMed Central. And that's where a lot of people have been turning to me for help and saying, you know, okay, this isn't in PubMed Central, I don't have a PNC ID, what do I do? So my gut sense, from my personal perspective, is that there may be a sense, at least among administrative uh, types and, you know, potentially not faculty per se, but, you know, definitely among the, the support staff, that the library can be a place to go to when these types of compliance issues um, uh, rear their, you know, you know, rear their heads. So, what we're doing, um, uh, you know, and Gail, I think, you know, summarized this quite well, is that particularly at a campus like this, and I think this has been touched on a little bit um, in, in, in the presentation, um, is that, you know, we can't go into this and say we're going to swoop in and save the day and everybody needs us and this is the way it's going to be. Um, we're very siloed. Everybody does their own things. Uh, does things their own way. There's probably lots of redundancy and duplication. Um, and the campus, for the most part, is okay with that. They want to do things their way so that, you know, if I need to tweak this, I don't need to go through 17 different things to make that tweak. Um, the decentralization and the lack of administration, they actually tout as a good thing here. <laughs> um, so, you know, so, so again, going back to what I was saying, you know, we really do want to try to survey the landscape. You know, all proposed new resources and service need to be based on evidence. Because right now, we are strung so thin that, you know, that there's, there's, you know, the unfunded mandates, we already have too many of those. And adding something else on top of this without there being a demonstrated need is just likely not going to get support. So, um, and, you know, which goes hand in hand with the last bullet point in that, you know, everything is going to need to be funded externally, and that's going to be a challenge, I think. So, um, I don't think I, there, I don't think there's any more slides. No, that's it. Know. Yeah, that's yeah, that's all you guys had. So, thank you, Donna, for that. Um, I'm now going to sure. turn it over to Margaret. 
Um, oh, actually, you did have one more slide. I apologize. Okay. Um, but just really briefly, I mean, you know, like I said, in terms of doing a, um, you know, a survey of, 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 you know, where where could we provide assistance should it be needed, um, you know, we've identified people that we're going to start having structured interviews with and essentially find out, you know, are we welcome to help? Um, can, you know, how can we help if, if, if we're able to? Um, but basically make it clear that, you know, you know, we are not going to be hiring a data librarian. I mean, we are actively reducing staff at this point um, and consolidating services. So, um, in, you know, anything that comes on board, you know, is going to have to come with external funding. So, and given my perception of the campus climate right now, I think it's going to be very challenging. So, okay, with that, I'm done. Great, Donna, thank you so much. Okay, Margaret, you're up next, Temple. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, that will probably help. Um, so at our institution, we're really at the very beginning stages of this. We've been sort of chatting about it and having um, sort of weird meetings about it. Um, we have sort of a strange planning group that meets infrequently and um, not on any sort of timetable to talk about these things. Um, but the things that we've touched on that sort of were brought up in this, this diagram that we had, um, we've sort of identified some stakeholders that, are, that we should be connecting with. Um, we've tried to contact our Office of Research. Um, they have been swamped. They have, um, they had a lot of turnover, so they have a very limited staff right now. Um, and the person that was recommended to us was doing something else. So now that she's done, hopefully they'll be on board with us. Um, and then um, we have some users that um, we're aware of to um, be talking to and finding out more if there's a need. We've had a lot of informal conversations with researchers about this, kind of um, getting a feel for what's going to be necessary and what uh, might not be. Um, we also have recently installed a, um, a test instance of a repository software, um, and we have the DMP tool. To the best of my knowledge, no one is using our DMP tool. It's not um, advertised very well, so it's one of the things we're working on is just getting out the word that we actually do have some things that could be useful to them. Um, we created a libguide with information also that gets some views, but not a huge amount. Um, so we're trying to get the word out that we actually like have some expertise in this and are looking into it to help people who might need it. Um, staffing and resources. Um, we are hiring a scholarly communications officer, and they are um, one of their jobs is going to be sort of tying up all of the people who um, are involved in this, all the players that we have, um, which includes myself and. Um, my colleague here who couldn't be in this meeting, Gretchen Snath, um, and then whoever is in the Office of Research that comes along and whoever else we make contact with. Um, so the planning stages have been a little lax here. We've just sort of jumped into like, you know, those informal conversations and trying to figure out what we might want to do. Um, and some of the people involved, but we haven't really identified um, as a department or as a working group even what our um, outcomes really are. Um, we haven't had a frank discussion about that or about how we're going to fund this thing. So those are things coming down the line for us. Um, and then we don't really have any um, documentation that we're following here, but we've been sort of looking to other institutions to figure out what, um, what things we might offer, what things we're able to offer, and what things might actually be needed. Um, for our repository, we're using the same software that Penn State uses. Um, we have some people on staff who are familiar with the scholar sphere that they have. Um, so that's what we're testing right now. Um, and then we look to um, like University of Milwaukee and James Madison University um, sort of have similar setups that we do. Uh, Milwaukee at least has a data librarian, which we do not. Um, but um, these are institutions that don't have repositories but are looking to um, have data services anyway. So they kind of give us some ideas of what tools might be useful, what things might, um, what education and outreach we might be able to provide with our budget and our situation here. 
And then we have our, our aspirational peers, which um, are a, a little bit of a long shot, but also um, sort of within grasp within you know several years of working on this, we could maybe get there. Um, I really like looking at um, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, they have um, like a board of people from all across campus, including in the, the different departments. Um, and I'd really, really like to see us move in that direction. And that's all the information that I have prepared. So thank you. Thank you, Margaret. It's good to hear what, uh, what you guys are doing at Temple. The University of Florida, you're up next. Um, floor is yours. Uh, this is Lori. I'm, I'm picking up the phone. Chelsea and I have been listening together on speakerphone. And I think Hannah uh, may yeah, also. I'm here also. I'm down at the oh. Health Science Center also at UF. Oh, that's great. Um, so uh, the first slide are just some images of historic UF data and then um, UF's Hypergator, Hypergator which is um, our supercomputer, and we're actually in Hypergator Phase 2 um, for expansion of the supercomputer. Um, so the second slide gives some of the context uh, for UF. Uh, um, so we're a public land grant. We're one of only 17 in the AAU. We're one of the uh, largest, most complex, comprehensive universities in the world. Uh, this matters a lot because when we're having campus-wide conversations on data, it means data for everyone. Um, and so data, you know, basic applied sciences, humanities, who I work with a great deal, arts, uh, law, um, yeah, everyone, <laughs> you know, 150 more, um, 150 plus centers and institutes, so many students and faculty and clinicians. and and because we are a public institution, um, high commitment um, and complete mission alignment for public and translational research. You know, it's about um, bent to bedside. How do we make these things actionable, usable, uh, have real value in the world? Uh, we're also historically underfunded. Uh, the joke that's also true is that we're the best at being poor. Um, we're great at being very tactical, opportunistic, and strategic, and doing those all as parallel activities. Um, so how do we strategically plan, prepare, go through a full process um, and looking at our data support, but also where do we see where there's low-hanging fruit or just opportunities and how do we seize those? Um, so that's a, an interesting way um, to deal uh, with the strategy. Um, and one of the things that we've always had is, um, and that we see as we work with different partners and different networks and communities, uh, infrastructures are always local. Um, and here at UF, we have, um, and when I say infrastructures, I'm always talking about socio-technical infrastructures, the people, the policies, the technologies, and the communities. So we have a culture and a rich tradition of collaboration and innovation. Um, and we also have a real focus with the libraries, research computing, and the Office of Research working together on building um, together to enable a culture of radical collaboration across campus and then as we extend out beyond to the greater Gator Nation. Hannah, do you want to add anything on this slide? Uh, no, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, greater Gator Nation is a hard one to add anything onto, but it, we really do embody that as the, the UF community and working with um, so many different groups and such a great diversity of data and diversity of different needs. Um, so some of the things that we're, we've put in place in the last few years, um, really superb technical infrastructure with Hypergator, the UF Digital Collections, which are powered by the open source Sobic CM digital repository software, which um, is both our IR, our digital collections, our newspaper collections. It powers all material types, rich metadata feeds, search engine optimization. So it does all of these things that our researchers need and workflows and integrated digitization and digital curation tools. So that's really fabulous, and we're really well positioned. And we do have um, our under, undergrad honors theses go right into it, along with their supplementary data. Our graduate ETDs with their supplementary data go, go right into it. So it's also a data repository with a number of automated um, or a number of already in, um, in place workflows uh, for data to be added. Uh, UF apps are some of the applications which run uh, on the virtual systems that all of our students have access to, and we're working on UF research apps so that everyone on campus will have access to different data um, software, so like ArcGIS, um, Gatorbox um, for data storage. And we're, so superb technical infrastructure, um, also really excellent evolving socio-technical infrastructure. Um, but this is said with, um, for a long time with budget cuts, we weren't hiring people. Uh, we 
it, we just didn't have enough people um, to do the work. Now we are hiring for a data management librarian. Um, we're working on a campus-wide data policy, which um, right now is best practices and draft. Soon it will be going through the approval process um, with the expectation that it will be a policy that's enforced before 2020. And this is being enabled through some of the rich communities and collaboration. Uh, with libraries, the libraries, research computing, and the Office of Research being some of the core players on it. Hannah, did you want to? I know I talked. I mean, to you I would just time. add that um, we have a new informatics institute on campus, and so that's a big player that we are trying to engage with and see kind of how they will fit with what we're already doing. And they have um, real strong connections with research computing already, who we also have strong connections with. Um, but we are inviting that leadership to our. Um, library-centered data management curation task force in the future. And in the future, we should have a, uh, an image for the Informatics Institute on this <laughs> slide, um, because they are really great partners, and we already are working with them on a number of different things. And they are a cross-cutting um, Informatics Institute, so they draw from and have representatives from every college on campus. Um, and so it's a really interesting um, way to bridge all of these data conversations and different needs as they apply to research, teaching, and service. And that's our last slide. Great. Thank you, Lori and um, Hannah. And I see some typing going on in the chat room, so you might want to just monitor that. Um, we'll have some time at the end to um, just kind of recap. Okay, Sue, you're up. Great. Um, I don't know how to advance the slide, but I'll just ask for it. Um, so this is UNLV's status. Uh, when John and I uh, read the, the article that was assigned, we felt like we didn't fit. So um, we created a little purple cloud of, you know, purple haze, and that's where we are. We're in, I think, what the, the authors of this article would have considered the pilot phase, the kind of poking around, seeing what's out there, what the needs are phase of research data management services. We are um, eagerly awaiting the creation of the positions and offices within our campus infrastructure that will support research data management. I just checked the, um, the provost website and the org chart that's up is from February and I think it's already stale. So we're undergoing a major administrative transition. We have a brand new president. We're um, looking at candidates for a provost and we are getting really serious about funding um, a tier one aspirational push for campus and we have just formed on paper and with a few planning positions a medical school. So we're, we've got lots of fun chaos going on, which leads to lots of opportunities, and we'll have to be pretty agile. So if we could move to the next slide, please. So you can advance the slide in the left-hand corner of your screen. You should see two arrows. Yeah. So uh, I prepared the draft slides around lunchtime, so I was thinking about uh, restaurants. And we have a really neat collection of menus, and this inspired um, how we presented where we are and where we're headed. So, yay, the animation worked. I thought that the, the article presented a really wonderful model of how you would go about um, working on uh, development of research data management services. John felt that um, he would like to see it more clearly cyclical and iterative than linear. So we identified some of the maybe aspirational techniques we could use in the next phase as the main dishes, which are all at market price. We can't afford them right now. We have a piece of John and a piece of me and a very small piece of our campus partner who's Associate Dean for Research and Engineering, who will hopefully be joining us on the next webinar. And instead, we're going to go with the Blue Plate special options, which is to try and embed some data management service questions in a campus-wide online survey that's going to be coming out soon. We're going to be doing um, some form in a, of an inexpensive environmental scan, trying to poke around and, and see what's out there, where the islands of excellence are. Um, some of the administrative or the academic units have created research data management services to some extent for their own purposes. Uh, see where those are, see what the gaps might be, and then 
I think that what we will do is some educational reading and reviewing of existing data curation profiles to better understand the questions we should be asking of our campus. And then I, I had to put the little, you know, half-baked or undercooked warning on our menu just because. So that's all I have. That's great, Sue. Thanks so much. Uh, time for, uh, oh, actually, University of Richmond is with us. Um, I did put a placeholder slide here for you all. If you wanted to add anything, feel free to do it in the chat room, or you may connect your audio. If not, that's fine, too. Um, are there questions or comments from either our guest speaker or the rest of the audience for each other? Feel free to um, use the chat room or um, speak up by audio. Scott, did you have any comments on any of these um, brief presentations? I was just um, thinking that um, in one of the things that I often think about is that it seems like there are so many different problems that we're all still at the beginning. And so um, making beginning inroads is like great. And it's like I learn every time I, I listen to somebody talk about, well, we're starting to do this and starting to do that. So I just want to say, um, you know, I, I encourage everybody to, to experiment and try. And it looks like you guys are. And that's great. Thanks, Scott. Uh, looks like there's some activity in the chat room, so I'll step back and um, let you all have discussion there. Unless anybody else wants to um, take the take the floor with the mic. Vito, this is Jason. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I wondered if um, Gail and Donna could talk a little bit about. So something that struck me as they were talking about reducing staff, um, have you or anybody in the room thought about how we might require data literacy in standard kind of reference librarian positions? Because that would be one way for, uh, as you're reducing staff, if you're introducing new skills into those position descriptions so that there's required skills, in the same way we've in the past uh, required information literacy or, or that kind of component to a reference position? Has anybody thought about how to uh, reframe some of our current positions? Just uh, hey, Jason. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, again, like I said, Gail had to um, step out. Well, um, well, in terms of, of staff reduction, actually, what, what's happening more here is that there's um, a consolidation of service points right now, and most of our staff and most of, most of what we're seeing now is just attrition due to retirements and things like that. Um, but my sense is that we're not going to see those positions replaced with other positions, if that makes sense. Um, I, I would, you know, would hope that I'm wrong with that, but, you know, my gut sense on that is that, you know, okay, well, if we have, you know, so-and-so person retiring, oh, we can get a data librarian. I, that's not going to happen. That, that will not happen here. Um, in terms of incorporating data literacy, I mean, that's something, I mean, uh, that Gail and I are extremely interested in, in terms of integrating that into the current liaison positions. And um, like we were just talking about this the other day, um, I had a request from one of my divisions to put together a series of workshops, you know, or, or talk about um, ba ba just basic best practices for publication. So in other words, you know, for the grad students, okay, when you're submitting a paper, you know, you have to know, uh, you know, here are your open access options. You have to make sure you put the funding in. You need to do this, that, and the other thing. Because it's not the admins that are doing it, and it's not the faculty that are doing it. It's the grad students and the postdocs. So there's already, you know, you know, so my gut sense is that there's already a market for this information. And one and I've already started talking to a few people on campus about, you know, hey, you know there's just gonna be this requirement to make data open and everybody just kinda looked at me. And a few people have said, you know, well, if that's something we could get out to the people who are actually writing the papers and submitting it and, and dealing with all these requirements, um, that that would be the way to go. 
So I think you're absolutely right, and I think that's a great suggestion. I mean, we like like I said, Gail's been on board here only for a couple of uh, only for a couple of weeks, and everywhere you look, there's a tire fire right now. But um, that is definitely something that you know what we'd like to do. We were talking about this yesterday. Um, basically, putting together a curriculum, something similar to what Gail had already established at Texas A&M, um, put together you know sort of like a, a set of plug and play workshops that each of us could just take and go to our you know divisions, go to a research group, and say, you know, okay, here's the basics for what you need to know in order to do this. So yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that that's given our particular situation that that's that's the route we're going to have to take. Are there other questions or comments? I see some activity in the chat room. I just had one quick question. I've been seeing that everybody's been great about um, posting direct links to some of their slides and presentations. Um, is there the group? Uh, I'm trying to look at the list. Um, the person who spoke after me, because I think we went first. Um, I'm looking to try to grab all those links. Is this is the webinar going to be archived? Yes, this webinar is recorded, and the slide deck will be made available through the Clear Connect community. Oh, OK, great, great. So we've got about 15 minutes left in today's session. Um, I'm not ready, quite ready to wrap it up, so I'm going to let uh, you all have the floor for a few more minutes, in the, either in the chat room or uh, by audio. So feel free to take the mic. I want to say thank you to Scott before he uh, steps away for being our speaker today. Much appreciated. Great presentation. Looks like there's a question from Ken, uh, Kendall. Have any other institutions presented work on developing data management training for liaison slash subject librarians? Potential to share for an upcoming webinar. So if you have. Uh, done those things, uh, let, let us know. Yeah, that would be great. And I see that there's uh, some agreement for sharing. And one of the things I'd uh, like to emphasize is one of the goals of the eResearch Network is uh, for sharing resources and um, ideas, and so it's great to see you all being willing to do this uh, in, in the webinar. So we'll be following up with you on that. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items while we're still typing in the chat room. Our next webinar is Wednesday, June the 10th from 1 to 2.30, and the topic uh, is data management needs. You will be, um, again, receiving uh, a simple um, a short, relatively short um, activity to do prior to that uh, webinar in preparation for that. And we will have a guest speaker as well. Uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is to take a few minutes to look over the call for proposals for the DLF forum that's coming up in October in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, we will be holding our final in-person meeting just prior to or actually the Wednesday of the forum. But one thing we'd like the, to encourage the group to do is to consider collaborating on a panel or presentation for the forum. Um, the call for proposals closes on June 22nd. So if you have questions uh, about that or any concerns, please let us know. You can either let me know, or Bethany, or Louisa quasi uh, And uh, we did have success with this in last year's uh, cohort. So it's something we look forward to showcasing at the forum.
And uh, while you're still typing, I'll just uh, remind you that uh, Clear Connect is our kind of private community that we use for uh, discussion posts and uh, the library within that community is where I'll be placing the slide deck from today and any future slide decks. Great, it looks like a few of you will be at the Harvard-Purdue meeting in June. That's great, so take time to find one another and Share some ideas or thoughts while you're there. Yes, Kendall, great idea. I use Clear Connect to start the initial brainstorming for a DLF forum panel. Thank you, Jason, for posting that. OK, we've got about 10 minutes left. And uh, if there's uh, anything else anyone would like to add, feel free. I'm going to step back and let the clock tick and um, close it out right at 2.30. I want to thank everyone for coming today. I want to thank Bethany for joining us. And um, again, a, a hearty welcome to our new members, University of Richmond.